welcome back to Kingdom 1000. It is really good to see you again. We are celebrating the 1000th birthday of equal justice. And if you're wondering why I have suddenly stalled a little bit, it's because the gremlins that we had managed to quash last week with the help of Manju have rejoined us in the split second that we have just started, um, which means I'm really sorry, you, Liu, I know you have just switched on your camera. I'm going to have to ask you to switch it off because that's the, uh, the bug that I think has crept in. Um, that's not going to mean anything to anybody else, but hopefully that will have solved the problem. My name is Chip Gahoon. I'm a storyteller and historian, and I am really pleased to welcome you here for the 1000th birthday of the most influential law ever. The law that managed to influence Magna Carta, which itself influenced various documents all around the world, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And while we are very aware that we still have a long way to go before we get to equality for all, it was a start and we should celebrate that beginning. This is our chance to do that. All the way until around about the middle of October, we are going to be celebrating with various historians and creatives to find out exactly how you can join in the celebrations. And this week, I am delighted to welcome uh, a dear friend of mine and a textile artist. I think that's the right term. And if I press this button, hopefully you will be able to see her too. There she is. That's Rebecca. Say hi, Rebecca. Hello. <laughs> Did I describe you right? Is textile artist the right right sort of thing to say? Um, um, possibly. Seamstress artist of many different things. <laughs> Did I you suppose. actually make what you are wearing right now? Uh, it's a mix. It's always a mix. <laughs> so you take um, what's already there and you blend it with other things? Yeah, um, I make a lot of things and then blend it with new things and make, so I, I recycle quite a lot. I think that's important. So that's, uh, so that's always I think it's it. fair to say then that there's some equality kind of inherent in your work. Oh, definitely. It's very sustainability, equality friendly. Absolutely. I mean, the very fact that we are having a conversation right now is just mm -hmm. a, a huge moment that is inherent in equality because um, you're, you're kind of a Viking, aren't you? I am kind of a Viking. Yes. So now, it, I, I... it is in my blood. <laughs> Whereabouts in the world do you hail from? I'm Swedish. Swedish. OK, mm. that's important. That means we put the wrong publicity out. I think we've been describing oh. you as Norwegian. Oh, <laughs> well, Viking terms, not that big of a distinction between, I guess, people move around, but, you know, it's all. Absolutely. All <laughs> I think um, my family, we recently discovered, hails from Hungary, but it wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be here right now had it not been for one of those um, Hungarians going over to America and coming back here during the Second World War. So, again, we in this conversation we are just the that's, epitome of equality and that's in an fact, unlikely <laughs> i know <laughs> unlikely and, scenario the fact that you are um I, I think i can say this you are a woman i think so yes yeah and i think i can also say that i am a man that too is the epitome of equality it shows how far mm. we've come because there is no way we would have been able to be seen in public having a discussion like this uh, I mean, probably just a couple of hundred years ago in certain parts oh, of the definitely. world. Oh, definitely. Maybe yes. still forbidden. But what does equality mean to you, Rebecca? Mm, I think, to me, equality is fairness, both in socially fairness and in the eyes of the law. Mm -hmm. And I think, as you mentioned, being Viking, it's, it's always been part of me in some way. It, it feels like... It is the right thing to do. It's, um, yeah, it's quite important. Hmm. It is, yeah. And um, like I say, we are, 
we're here and that's that's mm -hmm. the truth of that and if you folks out there want to be here too the way that you can join us is by meeting us at kingdom1000.com or going to worldstorytellingcafe.com and clicking the little join this story button that will bring you into the zoom room with rebecca and myself and we'll be able to see any questions that you have for us in the q a later um last week i wasn't able to see the names of anybody who was asking questions so apologies if you were here then and um you asked your question and i i didn't credit you um, but i'll be able to do that this week which i'm looking forward to so yep yeah, do please join us right here in the zoom room you'll be able to quiz rebecca about all of her artistry uh, when we get to the very end of the episode but First, let's go back just a little bit more than 1,000 years to start exploring how we got to where we are now. What was the world that this wonderful law of Canute's Proclamation 1020 came out from? We today are going to be sharing the story of a monk, a monk called Bede. Some of you may well have heard of him, and unlike the story that we told last week, the story of Alfred and his cakes, this one we have um, a little bit more evidence for. So here, again, so long as I press the right button and no gremlins get in the way, here is the story of Bede. In the year 860, a young boy arrived at a monastery in the kingdom of Northumbria, a special church where monks lived. This boy had gone there to be taught by the monks, to learn to read and write and do mathematics. He probably didn't expect to become a monk himself. But the history books tell us that after a plague affected the land, all the monks died apart from two. One was Curlfrith, the teacher of that boy. The other was the boy himself, who was now a monk called Bede. Bede became a teacher just like other monks, and he wrote many books to help others learn, not just reading, writing, and mathematics, but he also wrote books to help them learn the history of the Angles people in Britain. The Anglers were the people who lived in the Kingdom of Northumbria. Though when Bede wrote his book, he imagined that everybody who had come from the land of the Saxons and the land of the Jutes were Anglers as well. He called them all Anglers when he wrote his book, The Ecclesiastical History of the Anglers People. Now Bede didn't just teach, he also loved to sing. People said he was singing all the time. And a letter between his friends even said that Bede was singing as he died. We don't know exactly what Bede was singing when he died, but perhaps he was singing about how he had managed to bring all of the Saxons, the Jutes and the Anglers together under just one name. A name that we now call the English. There you go, a short story this week, but a very important one nonetheless, uh, because of course it was Bede who gave us the idea of the English. Now, to explain why that was important, before Bede there were quite a few different nationalities living around the island of Britain. Uh, the main ones being the Angles, as you heard there, and the Saxons and the Jutes. What B did was he wrote a book in which he lumped all of their histories together under the term of his own nationality, Angles. And the chap that we met last week, Alfred the Great, he managed to get a copy of Bede's book. He was quite a religious man himself. And Perhaps one of the ways that he managed to get the solidarity of the Saxons and the Jutes and the Anglers all working together to beat back a common enemy of the time, which were the Danish Vikings, Alfred decided to adopt the term Angles for his own people. He saw the fact that Bede had used it as kind of like an indication that this was the 
the name for you if you were living on the island of Britain and you came from the same faith. So although these were lots of different nationalities, faith-wise, they could start calling themselves Angles. And that word very quickly became Inglisk. In fact, I think even Alfred himself wrote the word as Inglisk with a C. And personally, I prefer it that way because when you put English with an apostrophe, for example, the Englishes, it starts getting really weird, whereas the Inglisks makes much more sense. Um, how did you enjoy the story, Rebecca? I love this story. It's uh, it sort of it makes me think. Do you think he meant to to bring people together, or do you think it was an accident? A little bit. Um, I I imagine it was more accidental for him than it was for Alfred. Um, I think it for him it was probably that he was just writing for the people in his area, and he didn't expect his writing to become so popular. Um, I'd like to think that he was doing it purposefully though, or at least that there was some kind of uh, destiny for that was guiding him on what he was doing because it would make it all the more powerful if that was the case. I guess it's, it's hard to know this mm -hmm. far into the future. Um, do, so how did, how did Anglo-Saxon people think of equality? Uh, not terribly well, um, so far as I know, but it, it depends whereabouts in, well, it depends whereabouts in Britain you were, and it depends whereabouts in society you were. So the higher up the echelons you went, again, you and I probably wouldn't be having conversations like this. Mm -hmm. um, were you to have a very wealthy husband, and for that husband to die, maybe then we would be able to have a conversation like this, but it would be because you'd then sort of be assuming the the mantle of of your of your husband okay. uh -huh. further down the chain though certainly by the time of Canute making his proclamation there was a bit more of a feeling towards equality probably because thanks to the many kings before Canute like Alfred himself and Ethelstan a very popular one and Edgar the nationalities and the nations were starting to mingle and mix a bit, including the Danish. And in fact, one of the reasons why Canute came over in the first place, as we'll be discovering in a few weeks time, is because there was a bit of an English assault on the Danish, which not all of the English themselves liked. And so eventually Canute came over, very easily came to power and I suppose from there it was just a logical step towards putting out the first law of equal justice. Okay. Mm. So if he came to the monastery as a small child, the bead, was it was it a normal childhood? Was it normal to send your little kid to the monastery? I love this. This is almost turning into an interview of me now. <laughs> this, this didn't happen Bitch, last week. I have so many questions. <laughs> It's fine, it's fine. I must admit, I won't claim to know all of the answers um, because I am first and foremost uh, a folklorist uh, than the kind of historian who looks at the stories that people told from back in the day and what we can learn from, from that. And what we can learn from that to, to answer your question is that this was quite common for, again, those folks with money. You would go to um, the monastery to... Uh, to get your entire education is certainly if you were um, a royal or one of the, the lords or the nobles around the land. And I think quite a few ended up getting tempted into the, the life of the monastery in that way. Okay. It's actually no, because of the, the folklore that we even know that we're able to talk about the 1020 proclamation right now. It's because of the stories that we found that let us know the gradual leaning towards equality that you mentioned. Again, as this series progresses, stick around, Rebecca, because we're going to be oh, talking goodness. all about the stories <laughs> where we see how people were starting to think with an equal mindset and mm. why that encouraged Canute to do what he did. Okay. I've never travelled so far as to the Anglo-Saxons before. I do this time travelling sort of thing, uh -huh. but it's quite far back, so I'm I'm not entirely sure how they did things. But that's mm. Mm. so that um, item of clothing that you are wearing right mm. now, chronologically, where would you place it? 
Uh, it's probably early medieval. It's a sort of mix between Viking and Anglo-Saxon. Okay. Um, since I am an immigrant, I thought it's is it important to blend? So uh, it comes from the Vikings right into the Anglo-Saxons. Um, You're all we're all immigrants here. I mean, it, it's it's an well, island. That is you, that is. You can't get I here any other way. <laughs> I think somehow that might be why it's so. Uh, it, all these new ideas come up here because the mix hmm. of people. It's it's easier. It's easier to have a sense of belonging where everyone comes from somewhere. That's true. Yeah, I must admit, I, I hadn't thought of that. So tell us then, what impact has equality had in in your life and, and in your work? Um, I think I've always assumed that equality is important. Um, and then as I've gotten older, you have this feeling of that things might not be quite as equal as you wish it was or thought it was. and it's politicized me quite a lot personally um it's led me into feminism it's led me into thinking about how to make a change i guess Hmm. um i don't think society works as good as it could if things are unequal and unfair yeah, that's very true. Um, someone in our Zoom room here has commented a bit like sending children to boarding school. And um, I've only just seen their comments. So I'm not entirely sure <laughs> what that relates to. Well, um, I, guess, but... I guess sending your children to a monastery is the medieval equivalent ah, of sending yes. your kids to boarding school. Um, as far as I know, there wasn't many places where you could learn to read and write mm. in those days. So... I guess reading and writing is quite high up there in the... That's true. I mean, it was certainly the case all the way up to, um, I think we've got a story coming up later with a young Prince Edwy, who was also, Mm -hmm. he was a prince, but he was being taught by monks. So they were definitely the educators of the day. Um, Thank you for being far more on board (laughs) there, (laughs) understanding the comments of everyone here in the cafe. If you want to um, join us here in the cafe, by the way, again, just a quick shout out, uh, go to kingdom1000.com and click on the little join the story button. Same thing there at worldstorytellingcafe.com and you'll be able to ask us questions here. Um, I I actually thought I was going to be able to see Nate but it turns out that gremlin has returned so i'm very sorry if you if you want your name to be mentioned um please do say who you are when you are making your comment because that seems to be the only way i'm gonna know um but thank you very much for that the reason why i was a little bit in doubt about it is because i suppose in a way boarding schools have that element of uh a mix that leads to creativity um if we we think of there, there are so many writers I can think of, um, probably from the, the early part of the 20th century, um, mm-hmm. who began their life in a boarding school. Um, there are quite a few stories, actually, um, books even for children, where the children are sent to boarding school. Um, there's a particularly famous franchise, for example, that came out not too long ago, um, where basically it, it is about a boarding school, isn't it? So that mm-hmm. idea of people coming into a place and sort of creating a, a kernel of creativity, that, that is exactly what you described just there. And mm-hmm. I think um, it's, it's still going on today. Possibly. I think it's, it might be a mix between um, that, that probably does happen. But also, I think when you have people who go to boarding school are normally um, more privileged, I'd say, possibly. Hmm. Um, and I would say if you have the time, you have the, the resource and the, the security, it is sometimes easier to focus your mind on things that are creative things, maybe even equality, such as mm. going way hundreds of years into the future from now, but as in anglo saxons um, most suffragettes were middle class or upper class women because they had time and mm. um, focus to fight for equality 
That's true. That's very true. Mm. Although back in Anglo-Saxon times, there was still a, a lot of the art that we, we have from those times is the art of the common people. Uh, the, the things yeah. that they used to uh, inscribe in their, um, their jewellery or their doors or their mm. weapons. Um, someone here has asked about how um, equal it was between the classes. And before 1066, where um, the Normans came and really uh, established a greater sense of class, um, it was a lot more equal, again, in Canute's time between the classes. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's one of the key things that we see in Canute's proclamation, which was building on laws that Edgar and a few others before him had put out there, trying to say, you know, justice should apply equally, whether you are of noble birth or a member of the church or a lay person so uh, it it wherever you were in society you were seen to be a, a valuable making valuable contributions to it that's so interesting actually i can hmm. i can imagine that because of um early medieval after the fall of the roman empire i imagine everything's a bit of a mess so everyone hmm. has to pitch in and uh then it's it's easier if people have more more things to say, more rights. Mm. Where would you pitch yourself, Rebecca? What what class do you fall in? Uh, now we're in Anglo-Saxon times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think well, right now I have absolutely no idea. I'm one of these floaty Bohemians that go everywhere, so it's hard to tell. But um, I'd say if we were in the a thousand years ago, um, I I wouldn't mind so much actually, mm. because um, being Viking, I would have much more rights than uh, a lot of women in other places. I'd probably have to attend the farm most of the time. But um, Viking women had rights to divorce and to keep their property and things like that. So it wouldn't be the worst place to be. No, I think you're right, though, that nowadays it is way harder to, to necessarily put yourself, especially if you're in that middle bracket. Yeah. Um, but one of the reasons why I asked was to come back to the, the artwork that you produce and oh. the sorts of things that, that you do, because you've mentioned that you're a, a seamstress. Um, mm -hmm. where, where has that taken you? I mean, in what ways have you used your art? Um, I, well, I think I use most of my art for some sort of time traveling experience. Everything is linked to each other so the the seamstressing the making of clothes so it's like um almost like a vehicle for traveling somewhere i guess hmm. much like everything else so um i do a lot of sort of interpretive arts things of sort of who would we be if we were in a different time where would we go what would we do and uh, exploring that. my one of my passions is history so it always my art usually takes me somewhere in history hmm. so how, how do you do that then o obviously you you can create the right clothes of the period you can you can do research for that but but how do you sort well, of get so close to the to the so period? I tend to do so I made I made something for this story Ooh. shall we see Okay, I don't know how well this will work, but I do these these books, these are little windows into a history of time. So it's, Ooh. so you have a book, you open it, and there's a whole world inside. Now, I don't know how well you can see that. Oh, I can, well, I can see it very well on my screen because it's nice and big. <laughs> I hope everybody else can make it nice and big on theirs. And I've done... I mentioned before I do a lot of recycling and upcycling of things and that is actually coincidentally quite a medieval thing to do mm. uh, so you can find things I don't buy a lot of things I, I tend to find vintage books or secondhand books and lots of things around like um, these are papers from um, you know the candy wrappers you get on Christmas you can uh -huh. save those. 
and make a stained glass window. Oh, wow. You so fancy it. <laughs> Uh, well, <laughs> could you hold it a bit closer so that we can maybe see that? Ah, that's fantastic. And and you've, so is that three dimensional as well? Uh, it is, yes. Oh, wow. So and you've I, made I, all of that with sweet, sweet wrappers? Uh, no, it's partly sweet wrappers, partly it's uh, little beads, just ah. these craft beads and... Uh, Honestly, most of it, toilet roll. <laughs> <laughs> and it's glued together. And uh, I find these books, you can always find with the titles that sort of, I like to pick things that make sense. So this is a, a book about how to conduct yourself religiously well. Mm -hmm. And so I cut it out, cut out the pages, make the artwork inside. And uh, do you use it. the pages as well within the, the artwork? Yeah, usually it's it's sort of I like to create a story of mm. some kind. So it, it's always about something. So if you can see there's a little table. Oh. See if I can get that in there. There. there uh -huh. There's a little table oh, where wow. Bead sits and writes. And here are all the little there, the people on the sides next to the table is the stories he writes. And uh, you can find things everywhere. I collect things. I'm quite a hoarder of um, <laughs> these sort of, um, what are these called? Brochures, papers, leaflets, pamphlets, leaflets. Yes. Yeah. And one of the problems of English is that we have the we have lots of different words for exactly the same thing. <laughs> that is true, <laughs> and some words translate and some don't. So it's mm. so yeah. So this is my my little present to equality. That's fantastic, and so you you've done that with a book that presumably is not an only edition. There, there's no lots of... no no. So B it, wouldn't be worried about you, you know, getting too close to the ecclesiastical history. I of... don't think you would be that worried. Would you I, be tempted? Um, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll but, keep you uh, back then. But no, I, I actually learned, I learned a lot about Anglo-Saxon times during this. Mm -hmm. um, it's, all, it's always a study. And apparently before um, 1390, all books were made for commission. So you'd go... You go to someone to to a monk and say, mm -hmm. "I'd really like a book on flowers," and the monk goes, "Right, two years, and I'll give it to you." Um, so they could make it however they want, but this is definitely not one of those. <laughs> this <laughs> no. has been printed in its hundreds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it took so long to make a book back then, and maybe that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. why um, oral storytelling was so popular because yeah. people didn't really have any other way to, to consume it, did they? Probably. I do, I do quite enjoy the, uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages where people couldn't really read, they had a lot of imagery, mm. and some of it is quite hilarious. Uh, <laughs> do tell. Well, when, they, when the monks... Are you allowed to tell? Writing, uh, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure this is not all that okay. bad. I'm sure there are worse. <laughs> <laughs> definitely but when they were sitting and writing things they, they could sort of inscribe little things in the margins and uh, I have seen snails fighting battles with rabbits um, midi medieval people doing quite strange dances and uh, drinking out of cups hanging from a from a letter G and stuff <laughs> it, mm -hmm. they got quite creative actually um, and it's these it's these sorts of things that people don't usually know or think about when they think yeah. history. I mean, um, yeah. uh, I've been learning some Makaton recently and the sign for Viking, I think, is um, this with with horn, oh. um, which, yeah. of course, we know is, is a really good Victorian moniker for yeah. uh, Vikings. But it's not mm. actually true. They didn't have horns. It would um, be very the, impractical. <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed. Um, but also the, the sign for Anglo-Saxon is um, to basically imagine that you've got a sword and a shield. 
Um, oh. So we do, and again, it's it's no fault of the Makaton charity at all. It's a really mm. clear indicator of what you are trying to talk about. And yeah. it's based on, I think, a stereotypical view of history, which is, you know, Anglo-Saxon Viking times. This is when people would go out and just fight and chop each other up. Um, a lot of the reason yeah. why, you know, uh, programs like The Last Kingdom um, become so popular is because mm. of that. But there yeah. was so much more to it. There was so much more to the, the lives that the ordinary people had and the, the little games yeah. that they would play, the, the notes that they would leave for future generations. Um, I, don't, I don't know whether, because uh, again, we've had someone, uh, Fran Francesco, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, <laughs> here in the Storytelling Cafe with us, mm -hmm. um, who has asked whether what we are, I guess what we're doing here is presenting mm -hmm. a, a really romantic view of history that may attract a few more people into the world of history. And mm. there's certainly a lot of it that wasn't particularly romantic. Um, again, if you were picking up one of the swords, which you would have to do if you were yeah. an Anglo-Saxon, they, they didn't have an army for a very long time in the period that mm. we're talking about. You would basically, if you were a man, it would be your job to pick up a sword and go and defend your town. Yeah, um, probably. Whether you want to do or not, yeah. Um, and again, probably some of the women would do that as well if if they had to if they I think so them. yeah you'd you'd have to you'd have to work together in some way mm. in but the thing is the only way we can really know what people thought about of the time is mm. through the stories that they shared because they weren't able to yeah. leave us um, diaries they weren't able to leave us photos or videos or anything like that and mm. the stories that they wanted to share were stories about togetherness, stories about family, stories about a, a journeys and adventure and occasionally magic as well, which I think does show us that these were people who had very similar loves to what we have right now. And if anything's going to get you um, interested and engaged with history, I, I do. I think, I think that's what it is, looking back at, looking back at the stories. That, that's certainly what worked for me anyway. <laughs> I and think, it seems yeah, to have worked for you as well. Well, I think the, the interesting, the one thing that drew me into history is how people never really change. Everyone throughout all of ages, our situations change and society changes and everything. But people as individual people are quite similar. So mm. they want the same things. They think of relatively the same sort of, you said about stories that nowadays we also like to watch programs that make us feel good and makes it mm -hmm. seems exciting and i'm sure they also wanted that yeah after a, after a long day out with a sword or a i don't know plow. <laughs> yeah and of course it's stories about the future too um which they mm -hmm. they had even back then and stories about yeah. the future get people interested in science so quite often story is the the start of an interest it's the yeah. thing that um, excites our emotions, gets us passionate and leads to at least probably more often than not to what we're going to do with our lives in a way. Probably. Now, one of the things I loved about that little book um, mm -hmm. art that you created there, I, I, again, I, I don't know what to call it. And if you don't know what to call it. <laughs> oh, book art, I think is a good word. <laughs> Book art. We'll go with book yeah. art. It makes it substantially different from writing, which I guess is the other bookish art. Um, but yeah. the lovely thing about it was that it, it's self-standing as well, isn't it? You can... Yeah. Well, I, I guess sometimes, sometimes I call myself a silent storyteller because okay. I like to tell stories in, in ways that it doesn't really involve spoken word as much. Things like books and costumes and pictures and mm. um, scenery of some kind because sometimes the environment or the, the the things around the things you don't say also tell a story of some mm. kind that's true and in fact um, very soon after we first met Rebecca I remember um, getting dressed up as a Victorian <laughs> and oh, yes. um, having a <laughs> having a photo against a, a green screen and um, well, then seeing myself transported about a hundred or so years ago. That's, that must be um, a, a, an absolute brilliant way of 
showing people just how connected they are yeah. with their history. I mean, we're, we're talking equality mm -hmm. here, um, and mm -hmm. there, there are some very clear dimensional values of equality that we've already mentioned, like the gender, mm -hmm. um, uh, like class. Yeah. But there is also the, the distance in time. And we've talked mm -hmm. a lot about how, yeah, in a way, people are still the same. There, yeah. there is an equality now to what mm -hmm. we were back then. Um, yeah. And being able to see yourself dressed up as someone yeah. from the past uh, in that sort of setting. Uh, what, what sort of impact have you heard from people um, about that? Um, I think some people really, really like it. They see themselves in a different way. Sometimes also, um, this comes up sometimes, beauty standard is different in different ages. What we think is is attractive mm. is different so if you dress up in a different time you might fit in you might find yourself that you look exactly like what you should look like in another time so that's quite interesting you you start to see yourself a little bit differently mm. and uh i think that's good in a way it's like it's like traveling but in different times so you find different parts of yourselves or people that you know um, and you understand you understand the world better when you know when you know where things come from as well. So I, I mentioned I've never been so far back as the Anglo-Saxons before. Victorians, that's my home, late Victorian. <laughs> they didn't have cameras back in Anglo-Saxon times. They so I didn't do see. that so much, no. <laughs> and I am not very good with tapestry, so. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. So we are celebrating essentially 1000 years. We, we want this to have a bit of a, a birthday party feel. And we've got some nice self-standing um, bookaramas that you have been mm -hmm. creating for us, um, which is another term I've just invented. You're, you're welcome to, to take nice. that one. Um, <laughs> how, how else? I, I mean, I, th I think one of the reasons why you're here, Rebecca, is to help people decorate their homes uh, to celebrate equality. And yeah mentioned I think you know the idea of recycling and how that gets uh, mm -hmm. a little bit of the the concept in how else would you recommend people prepare for uh, a celebration of equal justice um well I think the best way to celebrate equal justice is probably to keep on going to keep doing things to make things more equal more sustainable in some way um try to do things in your in your everyday life, I guess. Um, not much. That's not much of a celebration, I guess. But it, it is. <laughs> I think I think um, I've probably um, we we've been talking about equality for so long that that we're we're really stuck yeah. on that. But what well, yeah. what I I guess I was asking was about the the decoration side of things. You know, we're having a party now. Um, so uh, what, how can yeah. we have a party that really makes? Uh, equality intrinsic so you, you've already mentioned for instance um taking some of the the wrappers from say mm -hmm. a, a, a Christ, christmas time um and christmas as well is one of those festivals that um whether you're religious or not now it's pretty big and that is something that did not start in this country so if you celebrate christmas in any way you are taking part in an act of equality essentially um and yeah you're sort of bringing little bits of that into your art um i, I guess yeah are there any other ways that you might um involve uh, different cultures uh, in in decorating and, and preparing for this time or, or different periods um obviously we've we've mentioned anglo-saxon maybe uh, um you probably can think of this better than I can, how you might be able to give your home uh, an Anglo-Saxon feel. Oh, uh, well, I guess, I guess candles are always good, good, good for, for, us, <laughs> for that's, yeah, I like, I like the idea of decorating things in different times and, and sort of, I guess, building it up towards the, the time that we're in now, a little bit of a time travel feeling. Um, my favourite way to celebrate is definitely candles <laughs> in any age. <laughs> um, but yeah, just uh, one thing, if you, if you wrap presents, I guess, for a celebration, you can always use newspaper. Mm -hmm. And uh, or I could, if I had a really little present, I could use my book pages. 
Yes. But yeah, just uh, that's pretty much what I can think of. I guess it's uh, one thing I have to I have to share before um, I forget it. There was one really interesting recycling thing, or funny, I should say, that I have from the Middle Ages, and it was speaking of monks. They found a a love letter that had been reused. They used um, the paper that the monks write on. They would uh -huh. use it inside their hats, and one of them was accidentally a love poem, and I thought that was adorable. So what? So they they made a hat with a love. Well, they, they would have to line it with something to make it. Yeah. So, so they lined it with the parchment that the the love poem was written on, but they didn't care much about where to put it. So uh, there was a, a bishop that walked around with a love poem in his hat. <laughs> that is, that's <laughs> a beautiful case. So, and I suppose if if it was a bishop, they they may have drawn some symbolism from the fact that they were Possibly. carrying love so close to their so close to their Possibly. mind. Um, Always had yeah. love on the mind, as I'm I, sure many bishops do. <laughs> I think the medieval people may have had a different view of love than we do, mm. but but I'm I'm sure it inspired him. <laughs> Well, folks, if you are watching this and you would like to pose a question to Rebecca or myself yourself, then you can drop in here at the World Storytelling Cafe right now. If you are on worldstorytellingcafe.com, just click on the little button that says join story. You'll be here with us. If you're at kingdom1000.com, you can do the same. If you're on Facebook, YouTube or anywhere else that we're streaming right now, go to those places, kingdom1000.com or worldstorytellingcafe.com. Pop in here with our buzzing chat and um, pose a question. Is there anything that you would like some advice from Rebecca on what, what you could do? Um, perhaps you've got a book uh, with an interesting title that you uh, would like to get some inspiration on how perhaps you could create a bookorama with it um, or some book art if you prefer. Um, maybe you have uh, an item around that you'd like to recycle and get some inspiration from Rebecca as to how you would do that. And of course, one of the reasons why we're asking you this is because Voluntary Arts helped us to put this project together and they are one of the partners for the Get Creative campaign that is to help you, well the Get Creative festivals, to encourage you to get creative with anything around your house, be it cooking like we did with Manju last week, um, book arts like we're doing with Rebecca right now and so many other art forms that we're going to be exploring over the next few weeks. And if you go to kingdom1000.com, you can upload your creativity there and share with everybody what equality means to you through your creativity, whether that is a dish that is a concoction of various uh, cultures from around the world, whether it is a book with a title that spoke to you and inspired a certain panorama or anything else. Pop in here and uh, join the chat. Um, uh, Rebecca, while, while I've got you here, um, a question that, that I would like to ask. Um, you said that you, you had a book there with a particularly meaningful title. Did you go out and look for that book on purpose? Were you looking for something that, that said bead to you? Um, a little bit. I had a, an idea of which kind of book I wanted it to be, but um, not anything specific. Sometimes when I do it, I look for a specific book. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, I wanted it to be something, something about history or religion or something. Um, but but nothing, nothing in particular. So I think I liked this book partly because of the front cover pattern oh yeah that is beautiful what what, what I, is it? i mean i can see it's a circle with flowers oh, it's, but... it's some sort of it looks almost christmassy it's holly mm -hmm. in, oh, okay. in a circle um and like a then the the titles of the of the different chapters such as of the love of solitude and silence that's mm -hmm. that's what captured me um, is, is that the, the book right there, the one that you've made the bookorama in? So the, the book is actually called Of the Imitation of Christ. But oh, okay. inside, 
it says this book is of the solitude, the love of solitude and silence. And I thought that sounds very much like a life lived in a monastery. Mm-hmm. I'm, so, ju- I'm just amazed that you, 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 you've got the book closed there. So, so you created the art and you're able to close the book as well. Oh, that's, that's sort of part of the idea. I, I like ah. the, the idea that you don't know it's there. So uh, in, in my own house, I have the whole bookshelf of the some are real, some are not real. And then you can take it out. And dependent on how much you want to read that book, it's either a disappointment or a delight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, I... I tend to collect old books hmm. when they have titles or are about something that might be inspiring, but, but did, otherwise did it you isn't. have that book to hand or did you go out and look for it? <laughs> no, I, I went down to a sort of antiquarian bookshop thing and looked for, I always look for the, the most used, le- least loved books. <laughs> um just Most because it fe- least loved well you know the ones that they put in a, a box and they're sort of falling apart and I like the idea of picking up and giving it some sort of new life so a lot of the times they're not very readable hmm. but um yeah so this is one of those one of those unloved ones so if you had been given the ecclesiastical history of the English people how uh, might that have changed your book Arama? Would you have come up with something else in there? Probably. It would probably look slightly different, uh, partly for the, the <laughs> guilt I would feel about cutting it up if it was, if it was old enough. Um, but the words would be different, but I think I had an idea. I always have an idea of, where it's going to go based on reading the story Mm. um it felt like it needed some sort of cathedral like feeling to it um so i would have probably made something similar but depends on the depends on the words depends on the size of things We've had um, some comments here in the cafe about how Mm -hmm. um one of the the obvious differences between the ages is in scientific understanding and a lot of the things Mm -hmm. that we um, sort of can explain through science now would pretty much have been thought of as magic um, a a while ago. Uh, Certainly if anyone time traveled back to the Anglo-Saxons with say a mobile phone that they would be seen as a wizard Um, and what we think of today you know with, with our science fiction would have mm. been their fantasy, their idea of, of wizards yes. um, going around and casting spells. That was essentially what they were envisioning their future to be. And perhaps that was what inspired um, a lot of the, the medicine that came out of the time, uh, what inspired mm. what would eventually be the, the technology. I think it was Ed who said that, and I think you've made a very good point, Ed. You're absolutely right. Um, Given that then, um, Mm. again, if we're wanting to sort of evoke the past without necessarily, Mm. no, hang on, I've used the wrong word there. Let's say (laughs) invoke. If we're wanting to invoke the past rather than Mm -hmm. evoke it. So instead of just sort of making everywhere look um, Mm Anglo-Saxon, we're going to just try and get ourselves in that mindset. What would you say is still unexplained today that we can still represent artistically uh unexplained yeah so things things like um obviously back then someone who was particularly good with herbs might get Mm. represented as a magician a wizard a witch um nowadays would you say there is anything that we can still play around with in in Um, the imagination i think there probably is i would say for for my part is probably technology that I don't quite understand but (laughs) um I don't know I think we've we've sort of explored so much and we know so much about the world that I'm but I'm I'm completely sure that we don't know everything so probably anything that seems a bit uneasy it feels a bit scary Mm. is probably the things that we don't quite understand yet usually fear is that you don't understand something 
So yeah. maybe, maybe that's what it is. Maybe challenging your fears about something. Maybe there's different kinds of these alternative medicines that maybe we now think they're not, they don't, they're not worth much. Maybe we're missing something. Like, um, I think it was in the, in the 17th century, they used to chew on a particular plant. And now if you went around chewing on a plant, you seem quite strange. Hmm. But in that plant, that was what then became a medicine later. They just didn't know why it made them feel better. So who knows? Yeah. Maybe yeah. maybe there is something in these. I, and, I, as you know, as you've been talking, I've realized, of course, this does happen all the time. I mean, you mentioned technology and there are so many stories, aren't there, about um a technology going wrong or, or having to fight technology and and aliens is another big one we we don't yeah. really know whether they're there are whether they would visit um ed has also made the point in uh, what he was saying about how um these magical characters in the past would also still mm. be very much tied to their time through yeah. the other jobs that they might have such as the i think the sorcerer's apprentice is one that he's mentioned um mm. so you know they they had ordinary jobs too and you've got the, the wonderful works of Isaac Asimov um, showing robots having more and more um, yeah. normal roles in society. You've got um, things like Superman uh, and Supergirl, uh, Supergirl especially, mm. um, uh, the, the recent TV series, I think, mm. showing how aliens are coming down and integrating themselves in society. Um, yeah. That's a, a really good one for um exploring equality on a much bigger scale maybe the kind that they were envisioning back in you know 1000 years ago maybe yes now that you mentioned robots is probably one of those things that today is that that's in the future we don't quite understand it mm. um who knows maybe that's that will be normal eventually and we'll look back on this time as the time when we didn't quite get it <laughs> Let's not let people leave today, though, without some other decoration ideas. We've got mm -hmm. um, some bookaramas. We've got maybe some fancy dress. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what what else do you think might be a, a good thing to throw up around the house in celebration either of equality or the fact that equality is 1,000 years old? Um, what, what what would bunting look like 1,000 years ago? Bunting look like... <laughs> that was, I think... I think probably around a thousand years ago is probably greens. Um, oh, I don't. Definitely. I don't know if that is a thing um, in in England, but um, if you're Scandinavian, when when we celebrate Midsummer, which is our big celebration aside from Christmas, we take we still take in greenery and things into the house, and you're supposed to decorate around the windows and around the, the doors and I imagine that's probably an old pagan thing that comes from possibly even that time so that would be an idea if yeah, you want to decorate sure. with I love branches. that because you, you're absolutely right I mean I we don't celebrate it in exactly the same same way um mm. I'm sure there are still pockets of the UK where it is a, a, a mm. big festival um but there are loads of festivals which involve getting in touch with nature in a way yeah. um obviously we've mentioned Christmas a few times uh, and there's mm. the Christmas tree um yeah. for um New Year quite a lot of that is spent going out outside and making sure that you are uh, able to see the moon um, there are so many festivals which you know where food is an important thing and of course a lot of the food yeah. will be plant-based mm -hmm. so you know if plants are one of those things uh, one of those parts of the natural world that that mm -hmm. do not have any boundaries they, they don't care you know they'll very yeah. happily cross and they're usually the first life to arrive in any new territory yeah. so definitely trying to bring in some natural decoration mm -hmm. is going to both be a really big sign of equality and a really clear indicator of the sort of thing that they would have done yeah. 1000 years ago yeah and there, there's this idea i know in, in pagan ways of thinking that you bring in something green it brings life with it and so it yes. brings it's the life of the party <laughs> absolutely but that's what we want to be having we want to be having a really soulful party because it is 
1,000 years since we had our first law of equal rights, and we really should be celebrating it. If you would like to help an organization celebrate it, then anything you donate through the buttons here at kingdom1000.com or the worldstorytellingcafe.com will go to an organization that is doing exactly that called Youth for Human Rights International, spreading the word about just how important equal rights and human rights are all around the world and helping educators with resources wherever they are to be able to deliver that really important message and your contributions will be really welcome. But we would also love to see what equality means to you and how you are going to celebrate it, whether you are celebrating it in your cooking, in your decorating, in any other form of creativity. Head to kingdom1000.com, sign up with an account there and pop up pictures or videos or however you would like to share what you are making. And over the coming weeks, I have heard tell that there are going to be some competitions being run at kingdom1000.com. So definitely worth checking and getting your entries in now. There is hopefully um, certain viruses allowing going to be a nice big celebration, a physical celebration next year. And if you'd like to be invited, then one way to sort of get yourself on the invite list would be to start putting things up at kingdom1000.com. Join us next week and we are going to be actually thinking more about the words. We've got John Rowe, a spoken word artist, who's also the curator of the spoken word space at a number of different festivals, uh, including Cambridge Folk Festival, and who visits various places, picking up on the histories that people just, just talk about and turning them into wonderful poetry. And it's just a fantastic example, again, of how inequality and diversity can be inherent in anything creative that you do. So join us then if you have any interest in our history, in equality, in ideas of, of poetry and creative writing or creative speaking. Um, John is going to be a fantastic guest for us. Right now, though, I really want to thank all of our team here at the World Storytelling Cafe, um, our folks behind the scenes and uh, everybody who helped with the storytelling earlier, folks like Cambridgeshire Music and Voluntary Arts and Festival Bridge, without who we wouldn't be doing any of this right now. The West Stowe Anglo-Saxon Village. I, I honestly, I'm going to stop now. I can't name everybody who has helped us to get this project going, but we are deeply indebted to so many people. And of course, this is such a, a major celebration. We are celebrating 1,000 years of humanity's struggle to make things equal. We have come a long way in that time. This conversation that Rebecca and I have been having, just the fact that we are from different countries and different genders and uh, even different artistic abilities, you know, we, we, are, we are able to share here. We, this is e equality in action. So thank you to everyone who has helped to make it happen. Uh, definitely thank you to you, Rebecca. Thank you uh, for having me. <laughs> It has been wonderful having you and thank you folks out there uh, here at the cafe or watching wherever you are, be it with us now or on catch up later. Thank you. It wouldn't have been possible without you. It only remains for us really to put everything down. See, I'm leaving the buttons behind and say cheerio. Thank you so much and see you next week with John Rowe. Goodbye. Bye.